Good evening, everybody. How are you doing? Huh? I can't hear you over all the loud cheering. I know. It's wonderful. I thought you couldn't hear me over the echo. Echo. Could you hear echo. the echo in the opening? Opening? Uh, there it was there because I had a screen share that had sound uh, available. So, yes, that's, that's, a, that's what happens when you don't have Maven here running things behind the scenes. Right. Maven, feeling a bit under the weather tonight. So, um, we're going to try and muddle through as best we can without her. You've already seen... How well that how well that goes with the, very, so with the opening, yeah. <laughs> you know that that the echo was endurable until you got to the music, and then it was a cacophony. Yeah, a, a cacophony. I, it's a big word. I know what it means. It's a big word, but it's you know I love big words. You know. Well, good. It's it's not the good. cacophony that carries you off. No. Okay. <laughs> Any other any other thoughts here as we open? <laughs> Folks, we're grateful to have you with us. Uh, we've been having bigger and bigger numbers uh, in listening to the show live and getting uh, in terms of views to episodes. We really appreciate the new folks who are uh, joining the show and have subscribed to the YouTube channel. Please do that. Uh, just a really quick thing, RFM. Uh, this is Mormonism Live. I think this is one of the, the best programs, certainly under the umbrella. But there is a whole host of programs that we have, a whole kind of array of podcasts. Um, if you're new to the channel, please check out all the, the various shows, figure out which ones are your favorite and uh, figure out when they those episodes are published and tune in. But this is Mormonism Live. We, I think, have the largest viewership under the umbrella. Uh, really, I think, a great program to go in kind of the history and current events of the church. And uh, for folks who are joining brand new, we're really grateful to, to have you with us. Yes, and thank you for that, Bill. That's awesome that you say that. I appreciate that. Uh, and if you start uh, listening to, you know, sampling other podcasts under the umbrella, if you start with Radio Free Mormon, nobody here is going to blame you. Okay, no. I'm just saying. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Sweet. All right. Well, we've got a great show tonight. It is episode 120 of Mormonism Live. Today's date is March 22nd, 2023, and the title of tonight's show is "Silencing Dissent, Mormon Style." Now, there's a whole thing that's going on here because I got a phone call a few days ago from one of the guests tonight. We have two guests on the show tonight. We're going to talk about their experiences and you may actually know both of them, but we'll get to them here in a second. But in Mormonism, there is such an effort put forward by the leaders to silence dissent and certainly to silence criticism, criticism, dissent, kind of similar. Yeah. And there's a certain aspect of it that's in our face. In other words, the leaders actually tell us that they want us to shut up. And we're going to cover that here in a second with a few pertinent sound and video clips. Um, but there's also something else that's going on and something I think that's more insidious, certainly something that's more secret, which is in addition to the leaders telling you to your face that you're not to say certain things, there appears to be an entirely separate component of leaders, both local and general, going to people individually and privately and telling them they need to be quiet. So this is what we're getting into. This silencing dissent Mormon style is going to be talking about the behind the scenes activities of certain church leaders to try and get people who are saying things that are, I guess, uncomfortable to shut up. Let's start with a few um, video clips. We'll be going down memory lane. We've got one here from, oh, Elder Oaks. This is the famous one. This is the one that everybody thinks of. This is the first salvo about silencing members of the church, but this one is right in your face. Excellent. Let me throw it up on the screen. Let's see here. I always get worried when you talk about throwing up on the screen. Yeah, I don't know. Here we go. So 
All right. Uh, give me the thumbs up as long as there's sound, and uh, let's see what happens. It's wrong to criticize leaders of the church, even if the criticism is true. You know, Elder Oaks looks so young there. I guess it was a few years ago, but I don't think his attitude about uh, not criticizing leaders of the church has uh, changed since he became a member of the first presidency. Do you see any sign of that, Bill? Oh, come on. Are you going to make me say it? So let me... All right. <laughs> this time it's me. All right. Yes. So uh, the, the reason I have to keep silencing my mic is because to if I play the screen with sound, it doubles up. Again, we'll have an echo. But... Uh, I know he hasn't changed his mind because we have another soundbite from him that we can either play now or we can play later, but it's Elder Oaks essentially saying the exact same thing. Oh, yeah, we're going to play. Is that the one about the loyal opposition as in got none? It. Yeah, right. let's play that one as well. This is another example of church leaders telling the membership to be quiet about certain things. Here we go. Some who use personal reasoning or wisdom to resist prophetic direction give themselves a label borrowed from elected bodies, the loyal opposition. However appropriate for a democracy, there's no warrant for this concept in the government of God's kingdom, where questions are honored, but opposition is not. So there's another example, once again, from Elder Oaks, who appears to have a penchant for making this kind of comment, but he goes unobjected to by any other apostle. So what he says stands as the rule of the church, which is there is no room for anybody to be loyal to the church, but be opposed in any way to anything that the church does. I think that's what Elder Oaks is telling us there. By the way, make a special note, Bill, and everybody watching, make a special note that he said that questions are honored in the church. Because what we're going to find out from a few stories coming up is that that is not necessarily the case. Questions are not necessarily honored. If they're questions that make people uncomfortable, then you may indeed get a phone call from your bishop saying that you're not to ask them anymore. Mm. There's, also, there's also this idea that, you know, when you ask a question, whatever answer you're given in Mormonism, your job when a leader answers you is to be satisfied because the moment you move beyond that mark and you start to push back because the answer is unsatisfactory, now you're criticizing, now you're offering opposition, and those aren't allowed. So when you go to the church and you say, hey, I'm really having a hard time. I've read the CES letter and there's issues with Joseph Smith's treasure digging. Could you please help me? Again, questions are honored. Somebody's going to take a stab at it. When the questions d fail to reconcile the issue for you, at that point, you're out of options. Anything else you do beyond that now becomes criticism and becomes opposition. Yeah, if you're not satisfied with the answer, you really don't have room to continue asking it until you get a satisfactory answer. Because at that point, those questions are not going to be honored anymore, baby. No. <laughs> okay, and we've got even a third one. Now, this is something that was very important to me because I'm a guy... So I tend to see things through a guy's eyes. But I was talking about this with a woman, it's Rebecca Biblioteca. And she said, well, what about what Elder Ballard said about women being silent in the ward councils? And you know, that had not occurred to me. So I want to give her credit for that because what she said was very important. What she said was that what happens to men sometimes who speak up at church is what women live with day to day and constantly in the LDS church is being silenced and having their voices muted by the male leadership. So I thought that was really, really important. And I wanted to play this clip in honor of Rebecca Biblioteca, wherever you are, this one's for you. Well, let your voices be heard. We cannot, we cannot meet our destiny of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in preparing this world for the second coming of the Savior of the world without the support and the faith and the strength 
of the women of this church. We need you. We need your voices. They need to be heard. They need to be heard in your community, in your neighborhoods. They need to be heard within the ward council or the branch council. Now don't talk too much in those council meetings. Just straighten the brethren out quickly and move the work on. We're building the kingdom of God. We're preparing the world for the second coming of the Savior and the Redeemer of the world. And Jesus doesn't want women talking that much, apparently. Much. What's going on with that? What's happening? I feel like I'm on a bad trip. Is this? A, are you doing this on purpose? Is this? Work on. I don't what? talk too much in those council meetings. I don't. <laughs> now it looks like he's doing the Watusi. Talk too much in those council meetings. Or as Adam West put it, the bat to see. Uh, so, so there's our uh, there's our clips. I, it's it's strange too, right? Like he says, we need your voices out in society. We need your voices in your homes. We need your voices in lots of places. But when it comes to your voice in the ward council, don't talk too much. And in another place, make sure you put a little lipstick on too. Right, that's important. Yeah, we need your voice in the ward councils, but just not too much, okay? <laughs> not too much. We don't just straighten we don't. them out and leave them alone, move along. And let them carry it on, right? Yeah. Just straighten them out right. quickly, let them carry on because <laughs> these guys have the priesthood and they're the ones in charge. Just yeah. remember that, please. How how well have we done having men in charge for 200 years? Well, 157 billion worth. <laughs> we've got a lot of money and we've also hurt a lot of people. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, collateral damage. <laughs> Seems like a the money isn't going to make itself, you know. Yeah. Oh well. Anyway, um, but yeah, but you came up with a, another excellent example of this, and it segues too, and it's an important segue because what we've been dealing with is three instances of church leaders, Elder Oaks and Elder Ballard, speaking in public settings and telling people basically that they need to be quiet. Certainly, especially women in more councils, <laughs> but. We're told to be quiet, and we understand that. And I think anybody who's paying attention as a practicing member of the church recognizes this and conducts themselves accordingly. Accordingly, In other words, they censor themselves according to the dictates they've received from church leaders. But now we get into another example, the one that you thought of, Bill, where it's not being done publicly. It's done, being done privately. So a private communique between a leader and a member telling them that they need to be quiet personally. And what was that one you came up with, Bill? Yeah. So this is, let me put it up on the screen here. Um, February yeah. 19th, 1981. That's some time ago. Let's do that. And let's The Church of this. Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the letterhead, the Council of the Twelve. This must have been from a member of the Twelve back in 1981. Who could that be? Well, this was Bruce R. McConkie writing to Eugene England. So Eugene England had was uh, Eugene England is the Bill Real and Radio Free Mormon of like the 1970s and, and early 80s, right? Wow, he sounds like a cool cat. He was. And so Eugene England is aware that the church taught the Adam God doctrine, which, you know, is something that we've covered a few times, uh, you know, in various places. Various. And uh, yeah, and so uh, Eugene <laughs> England is well aware of the Adam God doctrine, and he is trying in ways to communicate some sort of reconciliation out in the public arena. And uh, he writes a letter to Bruce R. McConkie. And Bruce R. McConkie says, I didn't even read your letter. I just threw it in a cabinet and I ignored it. And then he says, more things occurred that I was aware that you were saying. So I finally opened up that letter. I've never been one to want to kind of talk to people uh, out loud, you know, in the public arena about this kind of stuff when there's disagreement. But I'm writing you a personal letter to let you, to let you know, kind of set you straight. And what's important about this letter is this is one of the places that when you're studying the Adam, Adam God doctrine, this is one of the places that you go to because Bruce R. McConkie and Spencer W. Kimball are both on the record disavowing the doctrine. But here in the letter, privately, Bruce R. McConkie acknowledges to Eugene England that he's well aware that Brigham Young taught it 
uh, as doctrine and that Brigham Young was simply wrong. And But the, the thing we're using tonight is if we go to page eight, and this is a long letter, I'll share it here in the comments so folks can uh, can go find it themselves. And as you're looking for that bill, yeah, on page eight, this is a private letter, which was never supposed to be made public, but did nonetheless, much to Bruce Herman Conkey's chagrin. And page eight, let me know when you have it, and yep, then right you here. can go ahead and read that part. It's really kind of the whole thing, isn't it? Yeah, this is, so he goes through explaining to Eugene England that he knows the Adam God doctrine was taught by Bruce R or taught by Brigham Young and that Eugene England's not in a place that he should be trying to set the brethren straight. And so he talks about how the apostles and the first presidency are responsible for the church. And you can see right here, uh, if you can see my, oh, my cursor is going to kind of move all around, but mm -hmm. about the sixth line down or so, it says it's axiomatic among us to know that God has given apostles and prophets for the clarifying, sorry, for, for the, the edifying. edifying of the body of Christ, and that their ministry is to see that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning and craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive Ephesians. By the way, he misspelled slight there. I'm kind of surprised at that. Look at that. Especially, uh, especially a guy as specific and particular as Bruce R. McConkie. I guess he didn't 4, have the scriptures completely memorized, did he? No, no. 4, 11 through 16. This means, among other things, this is the key, this is the money line. This means, among other things, that it is my province to teach to the church what the doctrine is. Sounds like Elder Bednar, doesn't it? It is your province to echo what I say or to remain silent. You do not have divine commission to correct me or any of the brethren. The Lord does not operate that way. If I lead the church astray, that is my responsibility. But the fact still remains that I'm the one appointed with all the rest involved so to do. The appointment is not given to the faculty at Brigham Young's University or to any of the members of the church. So Bruce R. McConkie telling Eugene England, it is my province to teach to the church what the doctrine is. It is your province to echo what I say. You are to only repeat what I say or uh, to remain silent. Yes, sir. When I say jump, you say how high. That's a nice way of saying shut the hell up, actually. And, and it's a ridiculous stance because the church has contradicted itself on a billion things, right? So if, am I reiterating what Brigham Young said? Is that wrong? Am I reiterating what Joseph Smith said? Is that wrong? If I re, Am I reiterating what Gordon B. Hinckley said about the word Mormon? Is that wrong? If I reiterate... That's but, really uh, wrong right now, I'll tell you. Right? And so any given moment, current church leaders are teaching something contradictory to past church leaders. And hence, you really have this difficult thing in Mormonism, if you're a believing member, in never contradicting what a present leader says or open up the books to what a future president of the church might say, which will contradict things being taught in the present moment. Yes, in the in the LDS Church, we are all cafeteria Mormons because we cannot we? help but be yep. cafeteria Mormons. No choice. Yes. And you know something? I think this is a great segue to our first guest because as we've been talking, the Spirit has moved upon me such that I'm going to skip my stories. And we're going to go right to our first guest. If there's time or interest later, I'll talk about mine. They're more humorous than anything else. And if we can bring on Don Bloxham. Who we have here in the studio. There's Don. And Don, you're going to need to unmute yourself. Look at that face on Bill. He just loves saying that to people, doesn't no, he? No, no, no. She was she was smiling at me earlier when I was muted. So you you I think you clicked it on the screen on StreamYard there. Mm. Anything? Can you can you say anything? Mm. And we'll see if we can hear you, Don. Uh oh. Uh there, there, it is. there we go. Mike Perfect. is connected. Silencing myself. I'm just want to look at remember. that. Yeah. <laughs> Relive it, it a little goes bit. The there. Of the show. Yeah. Well. Unfortunately, in Mormonism, it's almost never self censure. No. No. Well. <laughs> no. Okay. Bill, I understand that you know Don. Is that true? Yeah. So Don. So Chris has been on the podcast numerous times. Don and Chris are husband and wife. Uh, they own the family ponds down here in Southern Utah. I both, they, they were listeners to 
my work and then I worked for the two of them and uh, I've known them for eight years now wow. and it's been probably the most amazing eight years of my life and much in regard to being having uh, Dawn and Chris in my life. Yes, it's so. been fantastic actually. Very, yeah. very helpful, very beautiful. Well, we're um, so glad that you're on the show tonight, Dawn. I understand <laughs> from speaking with you, I keep getting these ideas. I don't know what's going on. I just feel like I'm being inspired. That's two ideas I've had in about, I don't know, a minute. What is that bell going off? Is that me? I don't know. Maybe, a phone, is, maybe a phone needs silenced or it's connected know. Bluetooth or something. We're just silencing everything tonight. <laughs> Bruce R. McConkey would be proud, wouldn't he? He really would, actually. Yeah. He may have something to do with this from beyond the grave. <laughs> I know with every fiber of my being. Okay, well. Yeah, so you and you and Chris, uh, did you have an experience and uh, with some kind of silencing was that, that went again? on? Was that the um, thing again? Yeah. Is that your, to... oh, it's maybe it's my emails coming texting. in? No, it's text. I don't know how to mute it. I'm so sorry. I'm not tech savvy. I'm so embarrassed. It's okay. I usually just throw my phone against the wall as hard as I can. I, I turned it off. <laughs> but it's I don't still know how coming. to quiet the text on my phone. If I, if I mute it, if I mute, can you hear me still though? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, but now I can't hear you because I need a mic. You can't hear me? I guess not. Well, we're off to a great start. May, I hope that somewhere Maven is watching this and feeling really guilty. I hope so, too. I'm so <laughs> oh, you good. just heard me. Well, because I unmuted it, but now you're going to hear my phone ding because I don't know how to mute. Who cares? Who cares? It's phone. okay. It's Close okay. It's a live show. Okay. These things happen. Okay. It's part of the fun of live TV. <laughs> yeah. So tell us your story. Okay. Tell us your story. Um, I, where, I, I don't know quite where to start. You know, we just, Chris and I have been in the church our whole lives, born and raised. Um. We had, uh, I guess, the first fun, like the uh, preview, the foreshadowing to my more recent experience happened right off the bat. Um, you know, I, I met Chris at BYU, as, as every good Mormon does, and we decided to get married pretty quick. And uh, we went and talked to our bishop and said, hey, we want to get married. Uh, and he said, nope. You guys can't do that. Uh, you're not good people. You haven't, you've been breaking the honor code. And by the way, Chris, did you notice? Well, he said, how long have I? How long have you been in my ward? Um, three, three semesters, year and a half. Did you notice I haven't given you a calling? And because uh, like, not really. It's a student ward. There aren't callings. You know, there's like there's 200 kids and almost no nothing for anyone to do. And he's like, well, it's because when I very first saw you, the spirit told me you are not a good person. And I was shocked because, you know, I'm 18 and bishops are supposed to be inspired. And um, the, uh, Chris was like, yeah, whatever, you know, you're, I, he might have called him an asshole. He probably did. And I, and I was shocked the second time. We, we left and I thought, I, well, we're not going to be able to get married in the temple. Why or why does he think we're not worthy? I know Chris is a good guy. And Chris was like, ah, don't worry about it. There's lots of assholes, you know. It's, people are good. People are uh, bad in Mormonism just like anywhere else. I'm like, mm, okay, I guess so. We went to our home wards and uh, those bishops were like, yeah, fine. So we get married and we get going and we do the Mormon thing and we're popping out kids and thinking we're good Mormons, we're reading the history, we uh, love, you know, doing what, raising our kids in any way. We, um, the real problem is that we really liked being Mormons. We really liked the history. Chris was a voracious reader. I think you probably have seen my library. His I see life, a little bit our, of it from here. Uh, yeah, that's, that's small. That's, yeah. Anyway, so we're going to, as soon as we can afford to, we're going to history conferences. And it's great because we're, you know, talking with Bushman and Givens. And, you know, we're talking to Robin Jensen as he's working on the, the Joseph Smith. Brian Christmas Hales. Project. Brian Hales. Yeah. yeah. He, yeah, we were, we were tight there for a minute. Um, yeah. We're talking to all these guys as they're writing books and they're giving, you know, speeches on um, just 
different things as they're discovering. I remember when they talked about the DNA, um, you know, that new information. And so we, we were well informed and it was great. And we didn't have a problem with it. And we knew most Mormons weren't, but you know, but that's okay. They had other passions. Um, so we're, we're going along and, you know, we, we meet Bill and he moves and we're talking all the good Mormonism all the time. And we're kind of thinking things are like slowly getting better. You know, the essays are coming out. Um, and then bam, the policy hit. And it November, really, 2015. Yeah. Yeah. November, 2015. And I, I know Bill, I mean, I remember how literally the day it came out, Chris was on the, we were out of town and Chris was on the phone with Bill the entire day. Like they were so upset with it. It was really upsetting. Um, it, it felt like a huge setback. And at the time, Chris and I were teaching Sunday school and one of it was the oldest youth class. So these kids were getting ready to go to college and go on missions. And we'd been talking, you know, they're listening to the essay, learning about essays in seminary and asking us questions because of course we answer their questions and even say, well, I have the book where that's written. I have, you know, come, come, to, come by the house. I'll show you the book, you know, the journal of discourses where they said that, or, you know, because Chris can remember all the references. And um, there was a kid that had come out to us as gay and he hadn't told his parents. And so we were concerned. And then a week or two after the policy came out, um, the bishopric decided our entire ward that all the adult leaders should, I'm sorry, all the adults should meet for special meeting in the um, uh, I guess it's been a while since I've been <laughs> in the sacrament hall. The chapel? Um, yeah, the chapel. The chapel. Yes. Not, hey, it's a good it's thing. Nervous. It's a good thing when you start repeating <laughs> those words. I'm, thank you. I'm so glad. No, I, I've never talked like this about my story to anyone. I've talked, but only in like private groups. Um, so yeah, I'm not nervous. Um, anyway, so they discussed the policy with all the adults of the ward. And as shocking as the policy was, Chris and I were, were blown away by the response of our neighbors and these ward members. And, you know, this is a ward we'd lived in 15 years. We knew these people, you know, Santa Clara, 10th Ward, it's just a couple of blocks, a whole bunch of Mormons living tight together, teaching each other's kids, going camp, at, you know? Down around St. George, right? Uh, Santa Clara, yeah, yeah, right on the border of St. George. Anyway, the response... What was it that the, your neighbors were saying in this meeting that surprised you? They were bearing their testimony about how prophets know everything and this is a sign of the times and these gays are taking over. It was horrific. So they didn't see the retraction of the policy three and a half years later, huh? Well, I just, they, didn't, just, they didn't see that coming. They didn't see that coming. No, <laughs> no. And we got, we got really concerned. And so we made sure that in, in these lessons, you know, um, we are answering the kids' questions and we're talking about, you know, this, a lot of everyday people, like a lot of the people in the ward are reacting to this, but there are, there's other messages out there and we're, you know, scrambling, finding positive messages. And I know, Bill, you were a big part of that because Kristen, you were talking constantly about how we could, you know, not offend everyone, but keep these kids safe and, and yeah. communicate truth. Um, you know, within a couple of weeks, we didn't get released. We actually were sitting in sacrament meeting and a new teacher was called. We just got replaced without anyone telling us. No notice. No notice. And we're like, wait, wait, that's our class. Like, and Chris was like, hey, afterwards, you're like, hey. And he's like, I don't know. But nobody knew what happened. Hmm. So he got like silence without even being told he was silenced in that situation as, as did I, he was, he did most of the teaching. Um, but I was also, um, 
I was teaching Relief Society. I had the, this was one of my most prestigious callings because I was typically in primary or on the enrichment committee. Um, I got to plan the Christmas party a couple of times, you know, really cool things. I, I never got to really do anything. I think it was because I worked. But anyway, um, I was the substitute Relief Society teacher. So every three or four months, I got to teach. And when I'd been called to that, my the Relief Society president had said, hey, just have a lesson ready. Don't worry about what lesson number we're on. And I took that to heart. And I thought, okay, well, here's something I can do. Um, I, I can... I can teach every once in a while the women, my friends, these, these women that I've been hanging around, you know, seeing weekly or daily for years. Um, and thinking of, you know, the teenagers, thinking of the policy. And then, um, yeah, there was another, another young man that had come out to my husband and I right before he went on his mission. And I just, I was so concerned about the atmosphere in our ward that I wanted to um, help. And I taught probably over two and a half years, I might have taught 10, 10 lessons, eight or 10 lessons. Mm -hmm. Every lesson was on love. I, it didn't matter what the assigned lesson was, I did. I had a lesson prepared on love and inclusion on love and not judging. And I would find a way to pull some scriptures or pull some church history story and talk about being loving and not judging and helping people feel welcome at church, you know, things like that, that I didn't think were, I mean, these are, these are simple. This is simple right. Jesus, New Testament stuff. Love your it neighbor. It doesn't sound horribly controversial. You wouldn't think, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm teaching my lessons, uh, you know, once every few months and Chris isn't teaching at all. And he's over a, a, a period of months, over two or three months, he, or he and I have several conversations with the Bishop. Um, Chris was trying to help the Bishop understand the essays and help some of the people that were struggling in the ward that were in mixed faith relationships. And um, I, I actually recorded the final big conversation that we had because he came to our home. I had no idea why. He came unexpected in the middle of the week. Um, you know, so I invited, he came in, he sat down at our office table and, you know, Chris got home a few minutes later and he small talked for a minute and then he said, I'm here. I, I want to tell you guys, um, I want to share something with you. I'm like, okay. We really need to teach the doctrine when we teach. And we're like, yeah, not a problem. We actually know what's doctrine and what's policy. If you want, uh, if you have any questions, <laughs> um, but we're like, wait, okay. And he's like, so I printed this off and he printed us a copy of um, a, a chapter, I guess, chapter 11 in, in Called to Serve, which was a manual for teachers that was published back in the early 90s. Right. Right. It had quotes from the 70s and 80s and early mm -hmm. 90s. And he had highlighted a quote that said, teach from the scriptures and the words of the Latter-day Prophets. Um, there is little need for commentary or other reference material. And we're like, what? What's going on? What, what's the problem? And it, it took, uh, it took 40 minutes to get him to be clear, but he said, finally, I have had continuous and multiple complaints from many people over years. And you need to only read scriptures and only, or only read the lesson manual. You cannot make comments. You cannot add story you can't say anything and we say how do you teach a lesson by just reading the scriptures I'm like what does that mean he's like just just do, just do this he just kept po pointing at this one sentence and we're like why he's like what are the complaints let us address the complaints and he wouldn't tell us what the complaints were um 
over time, he said, I, I'd played a Whitney Houston song, and that's not church approved. Wait, 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 wait. You played a Whitney Houston song in yeah. Relief Society? I, I did. I what did. are you thinking? Love. The, the greatest <laughs> love of all. Which song I, was it, Don? I, I mean, it's not I, the Rolling Stones. It's Whitney Houston. It was the greatest love of all. Greatest and, love of all. Yeah. Heresy. And I, I know. I know. I wanted, I wanted the women to, you know, know that they could love themselves because God loved them. And, you know, and that's all. It was bad. I was wrong. But you're left to guess. Is that right? Because he never yeah, actually Yeah. He never you? actually told me directly anything. That mm. actually came from someone else. Um, he did say that I didn't teach the curriculum. And he did say that I guess the, um, I wasn't teaching the assigned lessons sometimes. So I didn't realize till but the end of the time, you must to. be talking to me. I know. I, but by my female leader, I was told not to. But apparently... Right with all of the complaints about my lessons on love and the way that I taught them, I needed to not say anything anymore unless I was going to read scriptures. And, you know, the culmination of, of the conversations were, if he finally just said we're, we were she wolves in sheep's clothing. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Your bishop told you and your husband that you were, wo you were wolves mm -hmm. in sheep's clothing? Yeah, because we knew so many things, and he just didn't know what we would say. We were dangerous. Um, we 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 could hurt fragile testimonies, and we said we would. Why would we do that? We we wouldn't do that. We we don't. We could, but we're not going to do that. That's not who we were. Right. And he said, "Well, you hurt mine." I'm like what? I guess Chris had talked to him about. Um, the essay about Joseph Smith polygamy and it really shook him. Oh, tell us about your bishop and his his uh, familiarity <laughs> with the essays. He on wouldn't the read them. Website. He didn't think they were true. He didn't think they were actually from the ch the church. He so he would he refused to read the essays on the church's mm -hmm. own website. Your bishop. Yeah. Just to just to intervene for a minute, my father in law, when I showed him the the original mormonsandgays.org remember there's aren't any gay mormons there's mormons and there's gays right yeah right. so the mormonsandgays.org and my father-in-law goes i don't believe you that somebody has sabotaged the church site and has put this there that i don't believe you that this is church material and it took a while just to convince him that this was official stuff from the church yeah so your wolves in sheep's clothing how did that make you feel shocked because we knew we didn't say anything that wasn't true. <laughs> and we were really careful what we said. Mm -hmm. You know, if people ask questions, we say, hey, come read this book, you know? But we just, we just didn't, we weren't there to hurt anyone. We were there to help people that were hurting. No, and I guess what your bishop did not know is that you and your husband are a safe enough place where people at church that at least two guys, I'm guessing, mm -hmm. came to you in confidence before they went on their mission to disclose to you that they're actually gay. Yeah. Yes. That, that happened. And, and there were several, there were, there were plenty of people in the ward that were struggling either together as a couple or in mixed faith marriages that, you know, would come and talk to us and, and you know, we'd have Bill, we'd get together and, and we'd talk with people and, what well, was your goal to try and help them along in their faith and answer their questions in a faithful manner or to take them out? No, our goal was to help them feel safe, feel like not alone. Like you're not crazy. You're not alone. It's okay. You know, you're not evil because you have questions. It's, you know, it's, and just really, you know, a lot of people aren't really even listening when they're that upset. They really just want someone to listen to them so that they don't feel so invisible. Yeah, so invisible, so alone. And sometimes yeah. I actually think the church wants members with questions to feel alone. Yeah, that, that that benefits them in some way. Bill, you're wanting to say something maybe? I just want to add that even in the midst of Dawn and Chris and myself, because I, I, again, people can believe me or not, even as the three of us are having private conversations where we're beginning to struggle with the truth claims of the church, I watched Chris and Dawn continually show up in space with people who were struggling and everything they did was to try to slow the person down from 
throwing the baby out with the bathwater and trying to get them to see that, that they could take their time trying to figure this out um, to validate certainly their questions and their doubts, but to make it uh, entirely safe and even encourage folks to stay in the church while they worked these things out and not to, not to just call it quits and determine the church wasn't true. I, I, I it's just, it, I, I'm always bothered by folks on the apologetic side and inside the church who say, you, you guys are just taking people out. I, I watched for years, Don and Chris privately have their own questions and concerns, but continually show up publicly trying to help people stay in. Um, yeah. It, the church you make, know. you know, in a sense has you compromise yourself that way. And they were good Mormons and they did it. Yeah. Thanks for saying that. It's a traumatic event to, to separate from the church, to go through that. And, and making that less traumatic was really important to us. Well, you ended up separating yourself from the church mm -hmm. largely over this conversation with your bishop, correct? Can you tell us about that? It, it really was. I mean, once he said, you can't talk, and he said, I'm not, you know, I don't, I'm not comfortable with you speaking in church. I really don't even want you to pray. I just keep, but he literally said, just bow your heads and, and be quiet. And say and, yes. Yeah, yeah, or no. But he actually went on to say he doesn't want you speaking in church, teaching in church, even praying in church. Answering questions, yeah. Just, just be quiet. Just don't say anything. Don't say anything. <laughs> and they said, in 14 feel? months, I'll be gone. And then, you know, whatever. And we're like, what? Like, it wasn't that it was, I don't think he'd even talk to the sick guy. It was just him. He was uncomfortable. We were making people uncomfortable and he just wanted us to be quiet. But going to church where you're not getting a lot out of it and you can't help anyone, you can't say anything. It's, I mean, that's kind of brutal. That, that's just toxic. You go and you know you can't speak. We were talking on the phone about this last night, Dawn, and it suddenly occurred to me how much my identity, I think most people's identity is linked to their voice. Mm -hmm. If you show up in a space where you're forbidden to speak, it's like you're not even really there. Well, you don't count. You're not equal. You're not worth anything. So, yeah, it was, it was really hard to go at that point at all. So to get to the theme of tonight's show, let me ask you a couple direct questions. Had there been any official kind of church meetings, disciplinary actions, probationary meetings with you no. about this? No. It's just the bishop coming to you privately and telling you he doesn't want you talking anymore in church. Correct. And as a result of that, you ended up distancing yourself, becoming inactive as the lingo goes or less active as the newer yeah, lingo just, goes? Just less active. And I mean, I didn't get asked to teach again. So he must have said something to the Relief Society. So it's, yeah. you know, it, it wasn't like I had to say, hey, they've asked me, are you sure? Just, just we were just done. Okay. Did most of the, did the most of the ward, so again, you'd spend a lot of time in this ward. Mm -hmm. They're your, they're your neighbors within a couple of blocks of your home and you guys uh, go inactive. You stop attending church. I have to imagine that, you know, 75 members of the ward within a week show up at your door, wondering why the Bloxhams aren't going to church mm -hmm. anymore. No, you know, we, we struggled on for a few months, not really, not saying anything. Um, Chris held on a little bit longer a couple of our kids were still attending and then they kind of were like, I can't believe they don't see how good you people are. like it just, it really kind of brought the family together. Like this is crazy. Um, and when they were done, we were done and we just said, okay, you know, we're done. We're not coming to church anymore. Um, actually in a ward council meeting, cause we were on the ward council, but anyway, um, so we said, we're done. This is ridiculous to the Bishop and, and quite a few leaders all at once. And we left. No, no one ever said anything after that. Yeah. Like to this day, that's been um, almost yeah. five years. And I wow. have not been contacted by anyone about yeah. anything. And, and I say that sort of, you know, ever. facetiously because 
I know my that. experience talking to a thousand people is when they stop going, nobody cares. No. Yep. Hey, Don, I want to thank you for taking the time to come on and share your story. I apologize for giving you the bums rush. Our next okay. guest is, has a hard break in about 35 minutes, but I want to give you the option. I know you're super busy, but I do want to give you the option, Don, of staying here on the screen because we have callers who are going to call and maybe ask questions of you. Totally up to you. Uh, what do you want to do? That, yeah, I, that's okay. I think I could do that. Great. Can we bring on our next guest then? Uh, it's David Nolan. If anybody I'll take you off, Don. Thanks so much. Yeah, no problem. Thanks so much for being here. Did she say she was going to go or she's going to stay? I think she's going to stay. I think so. Oh, okay. Well, you can leave her there if you want. But David, how are you doing? If you want her on the screen, I can put her there. It's up to you. <clears throat> sure, it's fine by me. Yeah, put her on the screen. I like to see her. <laughs> so um, hey. can everyone hear me? David, I hardly recognize you. The last time you were on this show was briefly at the top about a year ago, was it, when you were talking about your then new musical, The Good Shepherds? Yeah, I was in my stage makeup even. That, that was the uh, dress rehearsal. Yeah, you're the director, producer, almost everything, songwriter. <laughs> yeah, so um, where do you want me to start, RFM? I want to start with, I got a phone call from you. Yes. <laughs> you I got a phone call from you and you <clears throat> told me what was going on. And I said, you got to be kidding me. When can we get you on the show? And we got you on the next show that was even available, which is tonight. <laughs> because Thanks. your uh, story shocked me. I told Bill about it. Bill said, hey, my friends, uh, you know, Chris and Don Bloxham went through a similar thing. So that's why uh, Don is here. Chris is otherwise engaged. But David, please tell us what's been going on in your life <clears throat> uh first of all don wow what a what a cool story well not cool is the wrong word what a yeah. what a tragic story and um you know we have a lot in common and i look forward to getting to know you and your husband because it, it's it's just you don't know how bad it hurts until you've been through it and um i i will say bill uh thank you very much for the um Bruce R. McConkie quote where you said, echo what I say or remain silent. Uh, I have a feeling that will be a new song um, that I will write. So thank you, um, Bruce R. McConkie, for inspiring that new song from the grave. Um, <clears throat> and and that, that, is, that is the truth. That, that is 100% what happens in the church is echo what I say or shut up. And... Um, I, I don't even know where to start, Bill. I'll, I'll give you the, I'll try to give your listeners the quick version. Can we start, start. with this? Uh, and I'll just try and direct you a little bit, David, since we've yeah. talked a couple times. Um, you are an active member of the church, correct? Yeah, we, we go every, <laughs> we go every Sunday and, and uh, people wonder how we play the, the mental gymnastics to do it. But yeah, we still attend. Right. And you've been going to the same ward for how long? Uh, this ward, three years. Three years, but for 40 years, you've been an active member of the church? Right. Okay. And I know there certainly was a lot of publicity around your show, The Good Shepherds, which, by the way, was a musical which pointed up the affluence of the church and maybe how they were spending their money, like buying Florida and not necessarily taking care of the flock. Is that right? Yep. Basically, you got it. So <clears throat> the point of the musical was just to ask you know, what would Jesus really do with hundreds of billions of dollars worth of stocks and properties and then leave it up to the audience to to decide if if, you know, if the church would put it all in the stock market, if, if Jesus would put it in the stock market or not. So um, I knew that the church would hate it, but I also set it up in a way that it, it made it very difficult for them to. Uh, just give me the axe, quote unquote, immediately because uh, because of how I set it up. I, di I didn't directly put the main characters as the prophets and apostles, so I didn't I didn't directly throw the leaders under the bus and throw the church history under the bus. I just asked the question, "What would Jesus do?" and and we're not even allowed to ask that question anymore because because as soon as your conscience tells you. There's no way Jesus would hoard hundreds of billions while kids starve to death at the same time. 
And then your conscience says, well, wait a minute, you know, what else, what else am I not being told? And uh, so, so, so they've hated, they have absolutely hated the musical from the beginning, but they had no way to uh, silence me, I guess, for a while because, because it didn't directly criticize the leaders. So uh, fast forward, whatever it is now. Um, it's Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023. Thank you, thank you RFM. I'm right here. Uh, fast forward and just out of the blue, I, I get a, a uh, <laughs> my bishop's a pretty persistent guy, but, but this time he was, he was way, way, way persistent and said, Hey, we need to meet right now. You know, I, I can meet you anytime, any day, any place, you know, we need to meet right now. So he's texting you. And yeah. Yeah. And I just said, what, you know, why is this so urgent? I mean, we, we had, excuse me, we had a meeting literally set up. We had an in-person meeting set up with me, my wife, the bishop, and the stake president. We had an in-person meeting set up. And do you know what this, that meeting was supposed to be about? It, it, it was, I'm sure, to get me to shut up and to not make comments and all the same thing that Don had to deal with. David, and, can you tell us about the comments that you're making in church and especially a week ago Sunday? I don't understand it. And I'm sure Don feels the exact same way because I, every and, and I guarantee this happened to Don and her husband. Every single time I made well thought out, intelligent comments, every time without fail, multiple members from the ward would come up to me afterwards and or text me afterwards, people from the ward and stake saying, Dave, your comments are the best. I wish I had the courage to, to ask questions like you, your com you know, Sunday school would not be the same without you, blah, blah, blah. Literally every single time, multiple people would come up to me, thanking me for my comments and my questions. And, and same with Don, like I never had like malicious intent. I always tied it back to either love or Jesus Christ. And uh, I, I guess the way I, I don't know, but, but the, the uh, true blue Molly Mormon, you know, those type of people, I guess they just can't even handle the slightest, the absolute slightest. Like I'll, I'll give you a quick example. So um, the lesson was on the premortal existence and they talked about the family the proclamation to the family. And by the way, David, this is yes. Sunday, March 12th, just barely. Yes. Right. It's and your stake president is in your ward and he's teaching a combined class of the adults. Is that right? Right. Yes. This was last. Yep. You got it. Week and a half. We could go Sunday. Sunday the 12th. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and he was given a great lesson I'll give him props for it. And he brought in the, the family proclamation. And I said, uh, and it, as we know, in that proclamation, it says the words heavenly parents, plural. And I said, you know, President, um, I, I would honestly absolutely love to know anything at all about my heavenly mother. Uh, you know, wh why is it so taboo? Wh why do we never talk about her? Why and I said, why are there why are there so many taboo topics that members just can't talk about? And he, for and whatever your reason, President said we can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. And um, I don't know for whatever reason, I guess that rubbed him the wrong way, and and um, I'm sure he put pressure on the bishop to immediately get me to shut the hell up. And uh, well, two yeah. days later on the following Tuesday, March 14th, is that when you start getting the text messages from your bishop? Yes. And I, and I do believe I'll, I'll, I'll say quickly, I, I do believe that, that the stake president is getting pressure from good old Kevin Pearson at, at the top as well, because uh, Kevin Pearson is his leader as the Utah area leader. So, so I mean, with all the massive news articles that came out about the musical, I know I've been on the radar. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah, uh, the bishop just started firing off text, 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 like, hey, we need to meet now, 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 now. And and <laughs> I just said, dude, I'm, I'm working like I, I guess I can take some time out of my work and give you a call. 
um, which I did ultimately. And he cut straight to the chase and said, uh, Dave, you are not going to make any more comments or ask any more questions in any of your second hours, elders quorum, Sunday school combined, any of them. And he said, if you feel like you need to make, if you feel like you need to comment, get up and leave. And, you know, as, as someone who, who very faithfully has gone for 40 straight years, um, that is the dead last thing that Jesus Christ would tell one of his faithful followers. That, that is the last thing Jesus would do is say, get up and leave if you have a question. And, it, and so I, I was, I was really, I was depressed, honestly. And, and I called my friend RFM and, and, and we talked and, yeah, so that's where it's at currently. Wow. So that's why I wanted Bill to take special note of what Elder Oaks had said, that in this church, questions are honored, but opposition is not. Apparently, at least in your state, questions even aren't honored. Yeah, question. I, well, okay. Here's how we need to. I wish that the leaders would just cut the bullshit and tell it how it is that they should say exactly what Bruce Armour Conkey said, echo what I say or remain silent because that, that is the policy and that is the truth. And that works for whatever, 95% of, of members who, who just, you know, decide, Oh, okay, I'll just shut up. But, but for those of us whose consciences are screaming at us, saying, no, this is not right, uh, simply saying, echo what I say or shut up, it isn't going to work. And um, yeah, the, the, church does, uh, the church doesn't know how to deal with me. And, and uh, it, it's, it's crazy. Like, I've, I've, until you have been explicitly silenced, like Don and I have, like you, you oh, it, it's almost... It's 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 the craziest feeling, and it, it sent me just like reeling for a little while. Um, but I'm doing better now, so yeah. We talked with Don a little bit about it. How does that feel to receive that direction from your bishop in no uncertain terms that you are not to speak in church? Uh, and just to make double sure, I uh, emailed him back saying, "Hey." You know, I'm I'm forbidden, I'm prohibited from speaking in second hour, but how about bearing my testimony? And he said, Yep, can't do that either. So it's uh it's pretty crazy. And you you nailed you nailed it on the head, Bill, when you said people's identities are linked to their voice. So for me, as a songwriter, I have always and will always write songs as my therapy. I mean, e even since I was a three, third grade, fourth grade kid, I remember getting hurt and writing a song about it as an elementary mm -hmm. kid. And ever since that point, I've written, you know, about a thousand songs and, and I know what I'm doing when it comes to songwriting. So you would think that, that the church would, would recognize and say, Hey, uh, Dave Nolan is a really good songwriter who can write widely publicized musicals, maybe we shouldn't push him off the cliff because it'll just piss him off and he'll write more and more songs. So ironically, their attempts to silence me are are just like that that night when when the bishop silenced me, I wrote multiple very powerful songs about being silenced. And um, you know, it it, <laughs> it I think they're messing with the wrong guy. I'm I, I'm not going to sit down and shut up like they all want me to because my conscience is screaming at me that hoarding hundreds of billions of dollars is the last thing Jesus would do. So no, the matter is not closed according to the SEC report. And no, I will not sh sit down and shut up. And, and I have, I have seen so many active members who attend every single week come up to me, message me, text me, call me, email me saying, Dave, keep it up. You're awesome. Um, and so as much as the church hates people like me, the church has to grapple with the fact that there are 
hundreds of thousands of people in their midst who attend every single Sunday with the exact same questions and concerns. So, I mean, I, that that's too long of me blabbering on, but yeah, that's kind of where it's at. Is it okay to ask if you would sing at least part of one of the songs you've written? <laughs> Let's put some links instead to the to the uh, song. The songs, a lot of songs are available on uh, Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube. Just search "The Good Shepherds" with an S, and you. Can oh, I meant the ones that you've written about this incident. Oh, uh, not right now. <laughs> okay, I well that's fine. I wanted to ask anyway, just yeah. in case. By the way, I know that this situation is in flux right now for you. This is happening in real time. Do you have any idea what you're going to do about this? Um, I, RFM, you and I were talking about this fact earlier. When the church is faced with a question of what is the right thing to do, sadly, they almost always pick the worst possible thing. So so what I mean is we had the freaking meeting set up. We had the in-person meeting set up with me, my wife, the bishop, and the stake president. It was set up for two weeks into the future. And for whatever reason, they refused to wait two weeks before putting me through whatever whatever they call it now, member restrictions, or I, I don't know. Apparently, none of that matters anymore. Apparently, right. apparently, restricted memberships and disfellowships or whatever, apparently, who cares? Apparently, those don't even matter because you can just tell people now to sit down and shut up and, and you don't have to pull them in. And, and I mean, it's crazy, man. Right. It's like you're under double super secret squirrel probation. We know that there's certain things that the church can do. There's policies about it. You can be excommunicated. You can be disfellowshipped. You can be put on probation. All of those generally would require some kind of meeting with a bishop and or stake president to talk about things. But what I'm starting to see here is maybe in your case and also in Don and Chris's case, there's an attempt by church leaders to do an end run around the policies of the church and try and silence people without leaving any kind of a trace or a record. And I think that from certain church leaders' points of view, that's much more effective to act as a dictator to silence people rather than actually going through the process that's outlined in the manual. Your thoughts about that, Dave and Don? Go ahead, Don, if you got something. Um, what was the question? <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. This is just my idea that it no, seems okay. like this I is something that's not in the plan. church manual. This isn't meeting yeah. with them and talking about it and having something happen, whether it's, you know, excommunication, disfellowship or probation. Now, forget mm -hmm. that. We'll just have a secret communication with yeah. the member outside of that procedure and tell them to be quiet. It's interesting that a bishop feels like he's got that authority to just say, nope you're making me uncomfortable, so I'm going to silence you. Right. And that that's, he doesn't get reprimanded. You know, he is going to, if, if it came into question, he would get back at the, he would get backed up by his mm -hmm. leaders. So we're, well, especially when his leaders are the ones by, telling him to do it. Yeah. 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 So I, yeah, I don't know. Like, yeah. So I, I think I'm in a very unique uh, place to be in as a member mm -hmm. where if, if they choose to give me the ax and excommunicate me, um, they can. But at the same time, I there were so many massive news articles, like even the Washington Post did, an, did a news article about this little musical in Salt Lake City, Utah. So every one of these reporters told me, hey, Dave, if, if, if there's negative fallout from this musical, we want to do a backup story. We want to, we want to follow up with you. So the church knows that. They're not idiots. And, and they know that if, if they give me the ax, but, I mean, it, it could be a, a pretty bad PR nightmare for them. Which would be all the more reason for them to try and go around the normal policies so they're not actually doing anything that's on the record. Yep, sadly. 
So that's uh, go ahead, Bill. Some folks are asking if this is coming from higher up or if this is just a local leader. And I would say it's a mixed bag. I, I think I, that in some of these situations, it's a local leader. Some of these situations, uh, at least I know in mine, it was higher up telling the bishop to, mm -hmm. and the stake president to kind of rein me in. I think I think you have to leave the door open for both possibilities. Yeah, I based on who the Utah area president is, uh, we all know the type of person Kevin Pearson is. So, I mean, I, I would almost I would be willing to bet money that that uh, our local leaders here are feeling the heat from higher up. Hmm. OK, well, like I say, these are stories that have to do with this thing outside the direct telling of members to be quiet about this, about this, about this. And then if that doesn't work and they're still piping up, now we've got this thing that's extra judicial, excuse me, extra judicial process of silencing people. Oh, you've got you said you had a hard break in about 17 minutes that you're going to have to go, David and Don, you're hanging on. Bill, would, would it be OK if we could take calls right now? so that people could ask questions of Don or David about their situations before they have totally. to go. So I just put the, the number up on the screen. I actually have the call in studio open. And so if folks want to, yeah, six, six, two, what is it? Six, six, seven, six, 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 seven, I think. Oh, hey, shoot. Now hey, I have guys. to wait for it to come by again. I'm sorry. What David? <laughs> hey, wh while we're waiting, hopefully, I, and I would love to talk to someone who calls in, but. Um, okay. Hang on just a second. Six, six, two, six, six, seven, six, 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 seven, or six, six, two Mormons. You got to Go ahead, David. Hey, so I. I am very, very far outside of my comfort zone right now for even asking, but I just, I just want to throw it out there. I did it on, on Rebecca's podcast the other day, and, and I'm just going to keep doing it on every podcast. And um, if any, any listeners or viewers have, have any sort of, of passion or means to, to help what we need to do, we need to give the good shepherds a real run. And what I mean by, you know, what I'm talking about RFM, you, you've, you were a stage manager in musical theater, a run. I'm talking two or three weeks in a good theater, somewhere near Salt Lake. And, and that costs money, you know, it costs money to rent the theater, to pay the actors. And uh, please, if, if any of you have any sort of means or passion or, or want to help out with that. The show deserves to have a, a real, you know, two or three week run. And I, I would love to talk to any of you who, who can offer any sort of support in that regard. How should they contact you? So, um, however they want. I mean, I can give you my cell number if you want, or I can give you an email. So the, the email, um, it's called the Good Shepherds. So TGS, as in the Good Shepherds, TGS Partnerships with an S, TGS Partnerships at Gmail. That'll go right to me. And then if you guys could put it in the show notes, that'd be awesome. So TGS Partnerships at gmail.com. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we'll put it in the show notes. Bill's working on that already. Thanks for yep. bringing that up. You know, Rebecca had sent me a clip from the end of her show. That's Mormon ish which she does with her co-host who's landing somebody. I can never remember his name because I only watch it for Rebecca. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> and we do have calls. Sorry, landed. Um, but she sent me this clip from the end of the show. And this was like the Sunday that this was happening. Uh, and you hadn't gotten the call from the bishop yet, but it was almost there. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about, you know, encouraging people to use their voice in church. If they have questions or comments, you know, you're not necessarily trying to throw a monkey wrench into everything or offend people, but, you know, use your voice to talk about mm -hmm. things that are meaningful to you and to talk about things that are true. And then like two days after you say that on her show, bam, bam. here he comes yep. the bishop saying no voice for you. Yeah. And just like Don said, I just want people to know and understand that they're not alone and they're not evil if they have legitimate questions and concerns. And even if you're like me and your conscience is literally screaming at you saying this is not right, you're not alone. There are so many members that, that, that think and, and believe the same. And, and I don't know, it, it's just going to get interesting to see how, how the church deals with uh, crazy people like me, I guess. Well, it's axiomatic to say that if 
you have to shut down the opposite side to win an argument, then your position isn't very strong. Yeah. Are there any calls, Bill? Yep, we've got three of them in the line. So Yay. Uh, yeah. we'll start off here. It says Beck. Let me uh, call her. What's the name? Hello? I've got Beck. Is Beck, are you there? Beck is back. Uh, Hello? Oh, okay, there we go. I can hear you now. Hello? Yep, your name? My name is Suzette. Oh, Suzette. How are you, Suzette? Suzette? Not the Suzette from the East Coast. Hi. Hi. Happy first day of spring a little bit late. Hi. Yes. Happy Ostara to all of you. That's what I meant. Yeah. Hey, well, I love both your stories. Thank you, Don and David. Like, I totally get it. And I just wanted to call in and add, like, my stories to this mix because I think this happens all the time. And Don and David, if you have any, like, thoughts or contributions to add, I would really welcome that. Um, I've been called into the bishop's office many, many, many times, largely <laughs> for my comments. Um, and one in particular... I had mentioned in, cl- in a Sunday school class that it was hard being a liberal leaning Mormon because conservative men rise to power in the church. And I kind of spelled that out. And the teacher lost his shit because he was, he said back to me in the class, God calls the leaders. And I said, okay, I get that. But if you're a conservative leaning heterosexual man, you rise to power in the church. Like, that's the well, way that's what goes. God is. That's anyway. what God is, Suzette. He's a conservative. <laughs> he's a conservative white man. So he heterosexual, yeah. Very European. heterosexual. We've seen pictures and... of Jesus. We know his heritage. He's European too. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so I got called in again over that, and my the thing is, is that no one would ever tell me who complained about me. Right. Mm-hmm. I would say, well, who's saying this? Just call them in. We'll have a discussion. We'll talk it out. Like, I'm not trying to be a We'll be adults. Here. We'll yeah. just talk it out. But they would not tell me ever. And I even said, I have three guesses. And I would name people in the class that I thought reported me. They, he, he still wouldn't tell me. So I just thought that was really interesting. And maybe David and Don have had sort of similar situations. The other one was, I got a calling to be like the most boring thing ever, like something like family history rep or something like that. Um, And someone from another stake supposedly had told the stake president that I was planning to teach people how to give women's blessings in the family history class. Now, granted, I was giving women's blessings all the time at this point, but I wasn't teaching people I was called in by the bishop and chose to go, and I had to have a witness there in the meeting to protect the church from anything I might say. Now, I am a woman in the church, which means I have no power to start with, but I'm also a single woman in the church. I am dangling at the bottom of the food chain, (laughs) and they still had a representative come in, well, the bishop just asked his wife because he knew I would lose my crap, which I did. And I was very upset about it, but this witness is not there to protect me. It was there to protect the church when we talked about women's blessings. And in all of these incidences and more, which are, I have many, I asked the leaders directly, did someone from outside this stake tell you to call me in? And they always denied it. I don't know if they were telling the truth, but I always ask them, did someone else tell you to call me in? They always said no. And then my last thing I want to say, and I'll get off, is is the same thing that Don mentioned. I have now been off the records of the church for five years. I live in the same place, and I still talk to many of the Mormons. They're still my friends. No one has ever talked to me wanted to know why I left anything, no outreach at all. So just wanted to add my stories and see if David or Don had any similarities, but I won't keep all of your listeners and I'll go. I just wanted to add those. Thanks for your show. Thanks, Suzette. 
Yeah, thanks, Suzette. What do you think, Don, David? Any responses to what Suzette said? Um, well, I would say that was one of the most infuriating parts of our of being silenced was we didn't even know exactly why because he wouldn't tell us exactly what the complaints were, just that there were many complaints repeatedly from lots of people over a long period of time. And he definitely wouldn't tell us who. Any. And it's, you go into it thinking you're gonna have a rational conversation, like, well, okay, what's the problem? Let's fix the problem. And it's not about that. It's just, it's, I guess it's just a power move to silence you, so it doesn't really matter what your questions are, what the reality is. You just need to be quiet. And it doesn't work in reverse, right? If 10 people in the ward think the bishop's an asshole, nothing happens. Mm -mm. Like yeah. if they don't want to hear what he has to say or they're bothered by the things that come out of his mouth, like it, it only works one direction, which, and, and as RFM pointed out, it doesn't even follow the handbook measures on discipline. So it's this ridiculous thing that simply because he's uh, he's the bishop, even though, you know, Monday through Saturday, he's the local electrician or plumber or accountant. Um, he has a special power and what he says goes, um, but it, it's such a silly thing. And it does, as RFM points out, work outside the realm of the handbook. Right. And whether it's intentional or not, the bishop is setting up a situation. And I've kind of been there too. Uh, they're setting up a situation where you are now led to understand that there are certain members, plural, in your ward who are so upset by what you have said that they have gone to the bishop to complain about you. And you are left to speculate as to who that might be. You're never going to know who it is. So it could be anybody. That's the position it puts you in, which is not a good position to be in. David, did you have any comments about those questions from Suzette? <clears throat> no, I mean, thank you for calling Suzette. And, um, and I'm, I just wish that, it's just so sad, like, honestly, like, and I used to also think that, how do, how do I say this? The top church leaders, I don't, I don't believe God specifically selects them because I believe that they pick robotic clones of themselves so that they all say exactly the same things and talk in the exact same tone and manner and fashion. And, and they're all just robotic clones of, of each other. So there is no variety. There is no diversity. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm just really sorry to hear that. Yeah. I think definitely the party line is that God picks all of the apostles. The new exception is president Nelson, who I think actually picked God. Hmm. Next caller. This is my favorite part. We're going to find out if we have the connection. Do we have the connection? Who's the next caller, Bill? Don't make me say it. All right. No, no. Here we go. Caller, go ahead, my friend. Hi, this is the backyard professor. I was hoping. I'm sorry. Who's that? Who's, what's your real name, sir? <laughs> <laughs> my real name is uh, radio free mormon jr oh okay <laughs> it's as if bill real and i had a, a love child together and it was the backyard professor go ahead would you have a question or a comment you know, uh, i do i just want to say hi don it's good to see you again it was fun to meet you when i was down in st george and have that party at your house and i also wanted to say hi to david nolan uh, your stories are so almost, I'm afraid to say typical, but they are typical. I mean, let's face it, this is the direction the church has gone. That's why so many of us are in this boat now. But if you two, both of you, would be so kind as to either get my contact information from either Bill or from RFM, I, I knew he was going to be poaching. I knew it was just a matter of time before poaching. I tried to poach our guests. <laughs> this is what the backyard professor is famous well, I, for. I, I, no, no I, I know, but this story needs to be told by everybody, truly. And your guys' experiences are probably becoming more typical than not. It's one reason why I'm out, because I used to teach Hebrew in priesthood meeting, and I taught 
the divine marriage of God the Father and Elohim Et, God the Mother, and I showed through the Hebrew how, you know, anyway, I kind Terry? of got taught to. Not Terry? as bad as you did, though, David, yes. Terry, yes. does the Hebrew tell who married them? Yes. Who married them? What? Who married them? The grandfather. Oh, God. okay. As long as he had a license. Bill has one of those now. Doing my second wedding tomorrow night? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I I think your I think your experience is you can come in but don't say anything, but it's your voice who makes you who you are and gives you your value. And if they don't want your ideas and just want your body, then tell them to stick it and go give your body elsewhere and use your voice elsewhere. They don't That's even care about your body, Carrie. They just care about your hard-earned ten, hard 10% of gross. Yeah. There you go. That's what we say in Japan. Yeah, I, I can't. Yeah, I, I like can't this. disagree with that. And then, uh, I'm not. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm going to make my ten percent back from them by doing my podcasts, telling the world how wrong they have become. But they can change if they want. They want to know what's causing the apostasy. They want to go on all these rescue missions, and yet they tell us what they've told Dave and what they've told Don. And if they can't figure that out, then more loss to them as far as I'm concerned. So, Carrie, did you want anyway, to give the, your cell phone to number to up. Don and David to contact you? Yeah. <laughs> What's your cell yeah, phone on, number, Carrie? Yeah, on the air. He's going to get a lot of calls. <laughs> <I am not laughs> gonna... Hey, <laughs> Carrie, I'll pass. As soon as this episode's <laughs> over, I'll pass it on to the both of them. <laughs> okay, with your permission. Is that okay, oh, Carrie? Yeah. David's going to pass uh, David, you guys. that guy over here. Bill, Bill, you, he's going to be passing along your cell phone you. number to uh, Don and David. Is that okay by you? <laughs> yes? I'll take that laughter as a yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's fine. Very good, now, very good. Have I you finished plugging do, your program I enough? Only do that. <laughs> Did you want to do any more plugs for your only show? I do that with these two because their story is so important. Until you get two more. <laughs> I agree with you. Yes, I think their story is very important. Until you get two more. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carrie. I'm not going to keep you. I, I, I know you have another caller, but I love your show. I appreciate everything everybody does. And this is way too much fun. And let's just keep right on rocking and rolling. So okay. Take it easy, night. backyard professor. Thank you so much. Bye bye. See you in the backyard. Yep. All right. And then there's, I've got two more calls in the line. Uh, looks like it is 745, Dave. So feel free to jump off when you need to. Do you really have to jump off now? If so go. Um, I got a minute. So okay. the next caller right. is, I think, Riley. Riley, is, are you there? I'm here. I would like to talk about the issue at hand. Okay. And talk about how it seems like the so-called church is claiming they love agency and love questions. But when you start asking certain questions, they want to suppress your speech. Now I'm one of these people that believe that free speech is important. And instead of saying or oppressing someone else's speech, why not use more speech? In other words, if you, if someone says something you don't like, instead of trying to silence them, maybe you should, offer a different opinion or a different side. Let's have a discussion. Let's have a have a debate or or exchange ideas. But this whole idea that this God that they claim to worship does not believe in free speech, in free ideas and the exchange of free ideas, is you know, it's it's coming to sound to me like the church is favoring a tyrannical deity. And to me it's really sad that a tyrannical deity in their mind honors agency. And I don't see is that as being true within the church? Well, mm -hmm. Riley, I think that's a great point. And we even see that with David Bednar, who's modifying agency to mean no agency at all. Yeah, I mean, they've gotten to the point here, uh, right. Riley, where you and I grew up in a church with free agency as a essential 
eternal principle of the gospel of Jesus Christ and David Bednar in one fell swoop, and you've seen it start to show up in other places, he has said that there actually was no free agency, that what you have instead is moral agency, which means before you joined the church, you had free agency. The moment you got baptized, you are now under obligation to do everything that Jesus wants you to do, which is AKA what the church and its leaders want you to do. And that's now called moral agency. Right. So agency is but now. But of course, that does not make you a moral agent. It does not make you a moral agent. It makes you a robot and following an organization robotically ends up getting you institutionalized, so to speak. Right. Well put. Amen. Thanks, Riley. And this is what concerns me about religion as becoming too controlling of people's ideas. I think we need need more more ideas and more speech. And I agree with you. I think that the problem that the church has is that any open and honest and frank discussion about church truth claims usually goes to a non-faith promoting end. Right. They don't like, have answers. They only want to promote the faith. If they had answers, no. they wouldn't be trying to shut down the conversation. They would just give the answers. Everybody would be satisfied. And we'd move on our merry way with women not speaking a lot, but allowing the men to lead the church. And we would go on with the good ship Zion and prepare everything for the second coming of Jesus Christ. But they don't have the answers. They know they don't have the answers. And that's why they're trying to silence people like Don, like David. That's my opinion anyway. Right. Yeah. Right. I appreciate Don's and David's stories. They've been very enlightening about what's been going with with the church i've i haven't been to church in several years so i haven't been wanting to yeah totally thanks riley well if you can't speak in church what's the point yeah. in going right yeah thanks riley i appreciate it yeah for sure okay bye-bye and now there's another caller is that true bill we uh we have one more in the queue uh okay. Caller, uh, let's see here. Caller, you're on the air. What's the name? Oh, uh, Jay. Jay, how are hey. you? I, I think I'll go by the term uh, trombone trouble. <laughs> okay. Um, you're on Mormonism <laughs> Live, trombone trouble. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there you go. Um, so uh, in Sp when I lived in Spokane, I, I attended a, 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 a meeting there and uh the bishop introduced the two speakers, the mother and the son, and and he, the son was like 12 years old, <clears throat> and he said, since the father was not active or not a Mormon, I don't remember what he said, but he, he said the, the, the boy had to be the spiritual leader in the home. And while I, I really re regret not going up to that bishop afterwards and saying, you know, you just undermine that, the mother's spirituality, you undermine their marriage, you undermine the kid, or even put that responsibility on the kid. Anyway, all that stuff. Boy, in listening to you, I've thought of so many other things. Um, last fall, the, uh, the local media reported about how the, how the Mormon church gets slammed or hammered. And I uh, called up that media and I asked them to make a ballot. A uh, story about how many times the Mormon Church or their leaders have slabbed other groups, and I didn't hear anything about that. Um, another uh, another thing that, uh, that, that stuck out with me was uh, a time when I was attending a funeral with a friend, a fellow she had been dating had passed away, and uh, she asked me to go to the funeral with him, and he it was all it, it was. The, the whole few, the fellow was, had been doing Native American practices, and uh, so many of the people that attended, other than the, well, the, the church, the fellow had not been a practicing Mormon for years. He, um, but his parents and family were, so it was at the Mormon church. And at the end of the service, the bishop got got up there and started bringing up Alma and, and my. 
and uh, even saying that Joseph Smith was a real big believer in, in, in Native American stuff, which I don't know that I could disagree with or whatever, but I wish I would have gone up there. And uh, <laughs> um, Anyway, um, one other thing, uh, just, oh, I forgot what else I was going to say. I guess hey, trombone, <laughs> oh, trombone hey. trouble. Jay. Yeah, thank you. All right. Jay, Jay you didn't yeah. go to Thrive last Saturday in Utah, did you? Uh, at the risk of, uh, uh, yes, I did. <laughs> yes. Because I heard there was somebody um, playing their trombone we, in a troublesome fashion while people were speaking. Was that you? <laughs> was it troublesome? <laughs> no, I, well, I just. You almost got yourself arrested. That's when, what I when, heard. No, no, I just blew it when somebody was introduced. Instead you were of clapping, going, wah, I, just, wah, wah. Ah. I heard all about it. There's a warrant out for your arrest, so I would advise you to lay low for a while. You heard secondhand information. <laughs> I heard it from oh, Washington no. State. That was a loud trombone, I'm telling you. Okay. Oh, hey, really? thanks, Jay. Jay. Jay, thank you so much for calling. Oh, you're you're tops. Thank you. Okay. There, there is this weird thing in Mormonism where 12 year old boys have more power and authority than women, adult women. It wouldn't matter if it was a 55-year-old woman or an 85-year-old woman or a 37-year-old woman. A 12-year-old boy has more authority. And the story he told where, you know, the the bishop is saying essentially like he's the one who presides in the home because dad's obviously not a member or not present. It does. It undermines everything. It puts so much pressure on the kid. It diminishes the woman. It, it's yeah. such a ridiculous thing in Mormonism. It's a twofer. Yeah. Yes, it is. By the way, before you you go and before we conclude the show, I wanted to make this observation too, that uh, we understand that there's a certain percentage of the population that say, you know, is homosexual, right? Which basically means in your ward or in your stake, that percentage is probably going to show up in about the same amount. But you just don't know who they are. Unless, of course, they come to you like they did to Dawn, a couple didn't, and disclose it to you. But it's this idea that there's a certain number of people in your ward who have been sexually abused, but you don't know it. They're homosexual. You probably don't know it, but they're there, and that's fine. The only reason I'm using this analogy is because I do not think that what's happened to David and Don and Chris has only happened to those three. I think it's happened to a lot of other people, and you are simply representative samples who are willing to come forward and talk about it publicly, and God bless you for doing so. But what that makes me think is, Okay, so how many people in my ward have also been silenced by the bishop? How many people in the stake have been silenced? Well, obviously, they're not the ones giving talks. They're not the ones teaching lessons. But how many people are there? Because I'm pretty sure they're there. The other thing is this. Like with Don and Chris, they got silenced, so they left the church. They became inactive. They stopped going. Well, how many people have stopped going to church in your ward? And how many of those might have stopped going to church because of the same thing happening to them and the bishop telling them they're not welcome to talk in church anymore or pray anymore in church or bear their testimony in church? So they just say, bag it. I'm out. I just wonder how often this happens because I got a feeling it's more than just you two. Any thoughts about that? <clears throat> there you got a comment right there that says i was silenced so so there's I mean, one so first of all this is so cool all you people commenting and calling like this is this is just amazing i i do have to run in just a minute but i, I just want to say one more quick thing so i think the most harmful thing that that has been told to me from various church leaders is <clears throat> why are you still here if you got all these beefs, why do you come? Why are you still here? And and I'm I'm sorry, but but the la the dead last thing I I could envision Jesus Christ telling a faithful follower is, why are you still following me? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I I I'm just dumbfounded that that a a uh, church leader can have the audacity to ask a lifelong member. Why are you still here? Why are you coming? 
if you have a question, get your ass out of the door. I mean, it, it's crazy. Oh, no. And I've certainly experienced that, too. And the fact is that they may be saying, why are you here? When really what they're saying is, why don't you get the hell out? Yeah. Because we don't want you here. It can't be much clearer than that. I, You know, I'm not a mind reader, but I don't think it takes one to to hear the intent behind that. Yeah. Now, you've got to go. Is that right, David? Yeah. And yep. Yeah, in just a second. So. OK, I know. I just want to be sensitive to your time. I'm not trying to run you out. But just trying to give you the leave to leave whenever you need to. Okay. Well, we're about to the end. Are there any other callers, Bill? No, I ended the phone line. We took four calls, and and uh, that was it. Okay. Well, let's wrap it up for tonight. First off, Don and Dave, do you have any other things you want to say? First off, Don and then David in conclusion, and then we'll wrap up the show. I I think I said plenty. <laughs> Yes, you did. You did I, great. Thank you. I'm I'm great. I really appreciate you guys inviting me to do this. This was the first time I've been this public and it's nice. It's nice to be able to to just to trust your story to be out there and be held by people you don't even know. It's it's really an honor. It is. I think that's great. Thank you for for saying that. This is a place where you can say what you feel. And nobody's going to come down on you or throw you out because of it. <laughs> David, anything in closing from you, sir? Thank you. Uh, yeah, just the last thing I'll say, and thanks so much, Don, for your story. I, I just love hearing hearing people who've gone through the same thing. And um, <laughs> again, I have had so many people, active members, coming up to me every single week. Dave, your comments are the best. I wish I could do comments like that. And, and I just want to say one thing. It, it is easy to dismiss yourself thinking, uh, I'm not like Dave Nolan. I, I can't write a giant, highly publicized musical. So, uh, you know, m my voice and my opinion doesn't matter. And so I'll just sit down and be quiet. And that is not true. And you don't have to write a giant musical. You... You don't have to have this huge public forum. You just have to be willing to open your mouth. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why the church doesn't know how to handle me, because I encourage members like me to open their mouths and to call out the BS. If your conscience is screaming at you that something isn't right, you know, you don't have to write a whole musical about it, but, but, you know, just talk about it and you'll be you will be amazed how many fellow friends, neighbors, ward and stake members, like everyone who has those same exact questions and concerns. So please, you know, just do it. Just try it. Great, great comments. Thank you so much, David, for coming on and staying long. Thank you so much, Don, for coming on. Everybody, thank you in the audience. Thank you, Bill. Did you have anything you wanted to say in conclusion, Bill? No, no. I, I think we've all experienced it. all of us on this side who raised a voice inside as we were slowly burning out of the church. I think we all have experienced on some level, some sort of pushback or, or telling us to be silent, telling us to be quiet. Um, it is a horrendous thing and it doesn't feel good. That's for sure. Well, I know it feels like this show has gone short. We're at an hour and 38 minutes into it. Last week, we're right we did at the three eight o'clock normal cutoff time. I know. This is actually how it's supposed to be. It's been at least a it. year since we did this. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So thanks, thanks everybody. Paul. Looking forward to seeing you next week, next Wednesday. Thank you again, Don and David. And next week we hope to have... Oh, no, that's going to be Bill's show. That's right. Did you want to introduce next week's show? We are going to go over the contemporary visions held by others that happened alongside Joseph Smith or before from which he would be either aware or would be in his milieu uh, that he could essentially put, we could place his vision in the context of those other visions and notice how similar they are. Oh, so other first vision stories contemporaneous with Joseph Smith. That'll be exciting, Bill. What a great idea. Sweet. We'll do that next week. All right. See you everybody then. Bye-bye everybody. Have a great it's night. It's wrong Bye. to criticize leaders of the church, even if the criticism is true. <laughs>